Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Clutch Talk podcast slash YouTube slash We Do It All. As always, I am your host, John. Very happy to be here. My boy, Jay Hizzle over there in the six. How you doing, baby? I'm doing good, man. Ready to talk about these jazz, man. Exciting guest on as well. Oh, yeah, we got a real exciting guest on. But my my boy, Jenner, man, how you doing, Jenner? Doing good, man. I'm excited to get into some jazz talk. They're a pretty interesting team. I feel like they're always up there competing. They're always getting at least the second round of the playoffs. So it's it's an interesting situation for them. So I'm excited to talk to Greg about that. Oh, yeah, man. So, you, you know, for an interesting team like the Jazz, man, a very controversial team, we had to bring a great guest like Greg on, man. So, Greg, uh, we are very, very happy to have you on. Uh, Greg, if you want to introduce yourself a bit to the fans, uh, talk a little bit about yourself and how you came about to uh, be a Jazz fan. Um, I'm a Jazz fan because I'm a masochist. <laughs> now, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong Utah. Hi, my name is Greg Foster. I am the co-host of Unsalvageable. It's a Utah jazz podcast on the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Um, yeah, like I said, born and bred Utah. I am 36 years old and have spent uh, about 35 of those in Utah. I live right downtown in Salt Lake City. I'm like walking distance from the stadium. Um, so it's kind of just it's it's in my blood, you know, like loyal to your soil kind of thing. And when you're that close, you know, I played a AAU ball with, uh, with Thurl Bailey and Chris Morris jr. Which of course, like the story I always say is if you guys remember, Greg Foster was, was a member of the, the jazz during their, their title run. And then like ended up getting a ring with the Lakers and played with the Sonics and everything. So when I was on that AAU team, it was just assumed that I was Greg Foster's kid. Because we had we had Thurl Bailey Jr. and Chris Morris Jr., so I would always get people coming and be like, "Where's your dad?" And I was like, "He's the old white guy in the stands, man." <laughs> that is hilarious, man. That is hilarious. So, Greg, well, we are very happy to have you on, man. Very uh, educated guest like you, like yourself. So, um, so yes, guys, like like yeah, like happy uh, to be here. Yeah. So, so like, like how Greg said, man, make sure all the fans, make sure you guys go check out Greg and his un- unsalvageable Utah jazz podcast as he has great Utah jazz content. But if all that's out the way, you guys ready to get into this jazz uh, talk today? I do need to interject really quickly because I swear on everything holy that if I don't mention this, Sarah Todd will publicly execute me at half court. So I co-host the unsalvageable podcast with Sarah Todd, who is the beat reporter for the Deseret news. And you can always check out her jazz coverage at Deseret.com. Oh yeah, definitely go Perfect. check. Definitely go check Sarah and all her workout, man. But, but as, as long as all that's out the way, we could go ahead and get straight into this jazz yeah. talk. So Greg, like, the first question that we like to ask all our fans here for these team interviews is Greg, as a jazz fan, are you content with the way the year went? Uh, are you, uh, as far as last season? Yeah, as far as last season. Uh, I I am not. Um, unfortunately, I thought that this was a team that had. Um, I thought I thought Western Conference Finals was what I would have been satisfied with. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. I understand that there were some caveats, and I do believe in my heart of hearts, trying not to be a homer, that uh, the Jazz would have beat the Clippers had Donovan Mitchell and Mike Conley been healthy. That wasn't the case. We can also make the argument that Kawhi Leonard wasn't healthy, and he missed the majority of the season. But the fact of the matter is, the Jazz choked. I thought they were fully exposed. I thought Tyron Liu did a great job uh, in the playoffs, and... Uh, it was it was a fabulous regular season, but in the words of Scottie Pippen, you know, don't don't mean a thing without the ring. And they flamed out in spectacular fashion. And knowing knowing the guys and being semi, I would say, team adjacent, I, I think if you talk to a lot of the players, they would agree and think that it was a bit of a, a disappointment, uh, disappointing end to the end of the season. So. No, I, 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 I wasn't super happy is the, uh, the short, short answer to okay. that. Okay. Well, well, I, you know, Greg, I, I gotta say personally, I thought you, I thought you were going to say 
you know, while, while you're right, you know, if you if you're not winning the championship at the end of the year, like what does everything else matter? Like, I totally agree. But, you know, I thought I thought that that you would, you know, you would be, uh, you know, a bit a bit excited having like the best record in the league at, at a 50 at 52 and 20, which uh, yeah. which, I, which actually leads me to my to my next point, Greg, because I want to ask, like, did you expect to be this good? Because, I mean, I understand, you know, you guys uh, flailed up and, and, ch- and choked in the, in the playoffs. So whatever happened, happened. But. The regular season, you guys were hands down the best team, both in the Western and Eastern Conference, playing insanely great team basketball. So did you expect this at the beginning of the year? Uh, I thought that the Utah Jazz were going to be in the upper echelon of the the Western Conference, you know, along with the Clippers, the the Lakers, um, and kind of in that, that territory. I absolutely thought that they were a titled contender. Um, did I think that they were going to have the best record in the league going into the playoffs? Absolutely not. I was high on the team. I didn't expect them to play as well as they did. You know, and I think at one point they won something like it was like 25 of 27 games or something like that. Just like a really miraculous streak. Uh, I didn't expect that either. I don't think that anybody going into a season, if you're a fan of a team expects that kind of a run. Um, so, yeah, regular season definitely exceeded my expectations. Incredibly fun team to watch. If you watch the way that Quinn Snyder runs his offense, pace and space, I thought the addition of Mike Conley was such a great move um, to have that floor general, to have uh, a, a mentor. He really established in his second year, great pick and roll chemistry with Rudy Gobert, which we saw in that Grizzlies series. He was a fabulous mentor to Donovan Mitchell. I don't think that there has been a player who's had a more positive impact on Donovan Mitchell than Mike Conley. Um, You know, and then later in the season when, when Conley and Mitchell were, were missing some games, uh, I thought Boyan Bogdanovich played incredible ball he had that almost yeah he had that almost 50 point game against the nuggets that was unbelievable you know the jazz just had three all-stars and the sixth and seventh man on their team in jordan clarkson and joe ingles like so yeah awesome super fun season um that definitely exceeded my expectations you know with the caveat of uh flaming out in the playoffs but yeah all in all super fun season that I'm going to remember for a long time. Yeah, Greg. And, and, and you know, I, I have to bring, I have to bring this next point up. So, you know, Greg, th- th- throughout the, throughout the season and, and you know, uh, us over here at Clutch Talk, we were doing multiple, multiple podcasts and, mm-hmm. and, and my brother junior here, you know, he, he had uh, a strong, uh, a strong opinion on the jazz, you know, throughout. And, and, and as mo- a lot of, a lot of people in the NBA community did, they had uh-huh. a strong opinion of, of the jazz they didn't know and really believe that the jazz were the true number one c you know the, the year was a bit crazy uh you know a yeah. lot of covet testing a lot of games got a lot of games got canceled so uh a lot a lot of us you know t- to be real didn't think that the jazz were the true number one seed so what would you say to that greg and and but did you think they were the true number one seed to you um you know, that's, that is a good question. Uh, at the beginning of the season, and this really reared its ugly head in, in the playoffs, I, I thought the Jazz were one player away, to be quite honest. They had all the shooting in the world. You've got, you know, the now three-time defensive player of the year in Rudy Gobert. Uh, you've got a budding superstar in Donovan Mitchell. You have, and you bring in Mike Conley, and then you've got your role players like like Ingles and Bogdanovich and Royce O'Neal, who I'll throw a stat at you, which is still kind of mind blowing to me. Royce O'Neal guarded the other team's number one option more than any other player in the league. And which was, which was amazing, you know, and there was, there was one game or two games in particular last year that I remember where he, the jazz went into Milwaukee and just dump truck the bucks early. It was that game where, you know, Bogdanovich had that, that crazy behind the back pass, like crazy ball of movement that ended up in a, I think it was a Rudy Gobert dunk or something like that. That was on like every highlight reel. And I remember Royce O'Neal guarded Giannis that game. Very next game goes out and guards Trey Young and holds Trey Young to like, I think it was, I don't know, 14 or 15 points. Yeah. Um, 
But the one thing that, that kept coming up was the Jazz need one more perimeter defender. They need one more big wing who's versatile and they just didn't have that. And we've seen now uh, in, in multiple playoff series, like Joe Ingles can't be that guy anymore. He was fabulous a few years ago, guarding JJ Redick in the playoffs when the, the jazz beat the Clippers in seven. Um, but him last year in the bubble, trying to guard Jamal Murray and then trying to guard all of the, the big athletic wings that uh, the Clippers have, it just, it wasn't, he, he's not that guy anymore, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, I, I kind of do agree that I don't really think that the jazz were that number one seed. And there were some, some real, real warts and some interesting caveats with, with this season in um, with COVID. I mean, to be, completely honest i had the lakers winning the title this last year you know and <laughs> like a healthy a healthy lebron james a healthy anthony davis with that supporting cast with schroeder and west matthews and the rest of that squad uh, i absolutely thought that they were going to be the number one seed and it looked like it i mean before before lebron and ad went down they were neck and neck you know and I think the Jazz hit the number two defense in the league and the Lakers had the number one defense in the league and I thought it was going to be close. But like, you know, I'm not a betting man, but I've learned not to put money against LeBron James. <laughs> um, so I was very nervous thinking like, oh yeah, I think this, like again, like this Jazz ceiling could very well be the Western Conference Finals and I'm happy with that. But like, if they end up going up against LeBron and AD in the playoffs, like I, I just... I didn't see them winning winning that matchup nor winning the title. Yeah, yeah, and and, and honestly, Greg, like I, I, you know, I totally, uh, I, I totally agree with you. And let, here, let me, let, let me check in with my guys here. So, Junior uh, Junior and, J- and Jay Hill, Junior, if you want to lead this one, because throughout the season, Junior, you were avid that you just yeah. knew the Jazz were not the number one seed. So, what to you? What were they missing? Uh, what what what? Why weren't they the number one seed? So for me, I think. Um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to answer that, that question last because I'm going to transition into something about a polarizing jazz player that one Greg could talk about a little bit. Um, but but for me, it's not even a knock on the jazz. Like I, I, We've talked about this as well. I don't think the Suns are Western Conference champions in a regular season, you know, in a season that didn't have so many hindrances. So it's not necessarily a knock on the jazz. I w- I'm with Greg. You know, I thought that probably Lakers would win the title. If not, I mean, the Clippers always had a shot. The Nets, you know, like there was – I think there were a couple of teams I would see coming out of the West before the teams like the Jazz, the Suns. But once we got into those playoffs, I did actually believe in the Jazz going to the final. I thought I thought that they would have beaten the Clippers. Uh, I thought that they would have beaten the Suns as well. Uh, I think they were better matched up for that series. But ultimately, I think I think what what uh, what kept me from having the Jazz as a true title contender wasn't the fact that they were doing anything wrong. It was the fact that there are other teams like Greg said, LeBron and Anthony Davis, Kawhi and Paul George. Uh, and if you look out of the East, obviously, you know, Philly, Nets, uh, 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 the Bucks, obviously won the title. Right. So I, I just had a couple of teams in the pegs above them. But I think that I would slide the, the Jazz into that pretty much the next tier after those those uh, those number one teams. But yeah, man, I'm right there with you. Yeah. So it's it's not even a knock on the Jazz. It's more of what they have around them. But um, what I was thinking as well is you have a player like Rudy Gobert. And that's the polarizing player I was talking about. Obviously a great defender. You don't win three defensive player of the year's titles on accident. Um, but sometimes uh, he's proven to be a little bit of a liability sometimes during playoff situations. So um, I guess what well, I want to let Jay Hill go ahead and, and answer John's question. But after that, I want to talk to you a little bit more about, about Rudy Gobert and kind of yeah. where you stand on him. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead, Jay Hill. Yeah, for me, you know, it was, it was who they were playing against. But it wasn't unnecessarily in the Western Conference or the Eastern Conference, the teams like you mentioned, the Lakers, the Bucks, those sort of teams. It was for me, you know, was Donovan Mitchell or Rudy Gobert, you know, a reliable star that they can rely rely on in the playoffs? And obviously, we didn't get to see D. Mitch uh, healthy down the stretch. I mean, he put together some some incredible performances, uh, you know, regardless. But I wasn't too sold on, you know, their number one option. And and throughout all, you know, championship teams have at least one 
are two options. And, I, and and that's even coming out of the West. You know, we look at all these teams. They got Paul George and Kawhi, you know, AD and LeBron. And and for me, I, if, even if D. Mitch was, you know, a solid number one, uh, I, Rudy Gobert is not the number two option that I'm, uh, I could believe in, uh, you know, especially in the West, maybe in the Eastern Conference. But even then, I'm not really sold on them. But for me, that was why I didn't really have them as a true contender in the West. Um and this year. Yeah. Um, just to, to, on your point with, with Donovan, uh, I understand where you're coming from. I will say that over the past two playoffs, Donovan's averaged something like 35, five and five. And I no longer have any qualms as far as Donovan Mitchell as a number one option. I think he's proven uh, since his rookie year that he can be that dude in the playoffs. But your point as far as the supporting cast, yeah, uh, I, I think it's valid. I think there were, you know, there were games where guys like Joe Ingles and George Niang who were very fundamental players who played big roles and, and had – great returns throughout the regular season were dormant in the playoffs, you know, we're, and that kind of thing can't happen. Um, and to your point about Rudy Gobert, I, I will say this, uh, Sarah and I recorded a eulogy at the end of the season after game six. And my take is, and I still 100% believe this is that, the Jazz have an Achilles heel, and we've seen it now in five straight playoffs. Uh, uh, and that is the five out, super versatile, switchable lineups. You know, it, it didn't work when they played the Warriors and got swept. Uh, what was that? Four or five years ago, they they lost to the Rockets two years in a row who could do the same thing. Then they go into the bubble and they lose to the Denver Nuggets who have another five out lineup and, and, uh, and uh, a once in a lifetime kind of center in Nikola Jokic. I'm a huge Nikola Jokic fan. Me I, too, I, man. Me I too. love, I mean, the guy looks like his entire diet is just Mountain Dew and Funyuns and he just goes <laughs> out and like cooks your okay, favorite player. Um, and, you know, and then, this year, the Clippers were able to go five out and the Jazz with bringing in Derek Favors as the backup center last year. The plan was, oh, we'll have a rim protector in at all times. And the Jazz went all in on traditional basketball. You know, we've got our traditional five. We all play the, that that certain kind of old school basketball while the league is trending into a positionless style. And yeah that has been their Achilles heel. And I think with Rudy Gobert, he's a bit enigmatic because he is a fabulous defender. I mean, the guy you, you put him next to the rim and the other team isn't getting buckets at the rim. Like he's a prodigious rim protector and yeah. he's fabulous on switches. And as a defensive anchor, he works and with the way the jazz are, are predicated the way that they play as well as their roster construction, everything is filtered into Rudy Gobert. You will watch people like Donovan Mitchell and Mike Conley purposefully get beaten on a screen so that that guy, you know, if it's the point guard or whomever has that open lane into the paint, because you're not getting that shot off over Rudy Gobert. He's going to shut that down. We saw that time and time again, you go back and watch YouTube videos of Rudy Gobert and he just will like, he, you know, he's always in the, the top five, top 10 when it comes to blocks in the NBA, which, but what isn't accounted for is how often the other players on the other team just don't shoot when he's around, but he certainly struggles having to get out and guard the perimeter constantly. He can do it, but those five out lineups are very hard for him. And then if you draw Gobert out of the paint with that, that, that roster construction, it's a lot easier for guys like um, Paul George or Kawhi Leonard or Jamal Murray last year to get into the paint. So I'm very, very interested is, now um, with the Jazz acquiring Rudy Gay 
who is a good perimeter defender. He's not elite, but he is he is a, an above average defender yeah. and played more minutes at the five last year than any other position. So I think the Jazz may have found their their answer to those five out lineups, and that is a that's a very intriguing signing to me. All right, Greg, I want to put you on the spot now a little bit. I okay. want you to tell me honestly and as unbiased as possible. Rank these three defenders: Rudy Gobert, Anthony Davis, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Giannis might be a little bit different because he's a little bit more mobile, but still, I want you to rank me these defenders. One, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Okay. I think he is the best, most versatile defender in the NBA, and he versatile. absolutely uh, proved that during the title run. Uh, I actually just got done reading uh, the Giannis autobiography by I think her name is Mir- Mirren Fader from The Ringer. Familiar, Cannot yeah. recommend it enough. It made me fall in love with him even more. Again, Dude, that's I'm, awesome. I'm, Huge, huge fan of Giannis. So Giannis is number one on my list. Number two is Rudy Gobert. Okay. Number three is Anthony Davis, which yeah. is not a slight to yeah, Anthony no, Davis. Yeah, no, they're all great I, Like Anthony Davis is, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this podcast. Go, Go for it. But <laughs> Anthony Davis is a fucking awesome defender. Right. He's really, really good. And we saw that, especially in the bubble. He made some plays in that, like just some recovery plays where he initially got beat by the screen or... Would, would somebody would blow past him and he was able to, you know, switch his hips fast enough to be able to get the block or, or disrupt the shot. Um, but I mean, we can knock Rudy as much as we want for his playoff performance, but if you go and you look at the numbers and, and you see Rudy's impact, he truly had one of the greatest defensive seasons yeah. in the history of the NBA last year. Um, and he really is fabulous. Um, and, and an absolute defensive anchor. I don't know. I have my qualms and my questions about Rudy being a franchise cornerstone. I think it's very, very hard to build a team around someone like Rudy Gobert. Okay. Um, but overall game or just defensively? I think even what he brings on the offensive end, I I really do applaud Rudy this last season because I know for a fact that Quinn Snyder came to him and said, you are going to have a more limited role on offense than you've had on in, in previous seasons. We need that from you, and we've got our guns. I mean, the Jazz had, I think, five or six players shoot over 40% from three or close to it this year. Mm-hmm. You know, and they set, they set a three-point record. Yeah, this season they they had multiple games where they hit 20 plays. Like they didn't need Rudy, you know, taking 10, 15 shots a night. And in fact, that would be detrimental to what they did. But what he does do, like the screens he sets, I know people want to, you know, poo poo screen assists, but like when you get a guy like that setting screens and getting guys who are fabulous shooters like Mike Conley and Donovan Mitchell and Jordan Clarkson and bogey and all the rest of them you're getting those guys open you're making their jobs a hell of a lot easier oh yeah and that's huge again, he was so he's so good in the pick and roll like there's been multiple seasons he's led the, led the league in in dunks and what is a more efficient shot than a dunk you know right. I and mean, you have a guy like that who can run the run to the rim and you absolutely have to send a guy or two to him in order to take away that role. Then you've got Boyan Bogdanovich in the, in the corner, who's a 50% corner three point shooter. Yes. So while he doesn't put up gaudy numbers, he is a, a major factor in the engine of what the jazz do when it comes to their ball movement and the amount of threes that they take. Um, so he's, he's a, a super interesting player. Uh, I think personally, he's kind of a weirdo. He gives off like he's like crystal guy. He's like the kind of guy you would see who like would buy gas station dick bills. <laughs> like you he's kind of he's, he's kind of goofy. <laughs> um, like he's the type of guy who seems like he's really into Joe Rogan's podcast. <laughs> but like, uh, I mean. I would have a very hard time, like if I was doing a draft and Rudy Gobert was on the table, I'd have a hard time saying no to him. Right. You know, 
and, and he um, is far and away the best defensive player or center in the league. Yeah, and 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 honestly, Greg, you know, staying staying along those lines, uh, I have I have a question here that I, that I I, I want to ask you know regarding uh, Rudy Gobert and also Jay Hill and Jr. I definitely want want you guys opinion on this um i mean like, kind of like how like how junior already kickstarted it you know we know rudy gobert is a a great regular season defender like how you mentioned uh he, he's very important in his in his screen setting and and a lot a lot of the intangible things that he does mm-hmm. but at the end of the day facts are facts and he ends up getting played off the court in the in the, in the playoffs like it some teams are able to play a certain way that eight that it plays him off the court. And like how you mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, if you're not winning the championship, then what are you doing? Right. So, yeah. so my question to you, Greg, and, and Junior J Hill also after Greg answered this, please like, do what do you, what do you, what do you personally do with Rudy Gobert? Because to be honest with you, if you trade Rudy Gobert, I don't think you're going to get the same value that Rudy Gobert is giving you on the Utah jazz right now, because the value he's giving no other team is going to give a player that can produce that. Because uh-huh. I, because all the teams understand that Rudy Gobert gets played off the court in the playoffs. So my question to you, Greg, is if the Utah Jazz said, "Greg, you decide what we do, with Rudy Gobert." Do you look to explore? Do you look to explore options, or you just you just keep them and you say, "Give me what you can." Uh, I I don't think that you can move Rudy Gobert uh, with that contract. Uh, I also don't know if I would like to move Rudy Gobert. Because I think that he is incredibly valuable and brings those intangibles. Uh, I am a Rudy Gobert defender. I'm also honest about Rudy Gobert in that he is limited. If uh, let's say if I am Justin Zanuck, the general manager of the Utah Jazz, I look at the roster and I say I don't believe that Rudy Gobert is the problem. What I think is the problem is the lack of versatility and the lack of depth. Quinn Snyder, one of the reasons Dennis Lindsay lost his job, the former general manager of the Utah Jazz, is because he and Quinn Snyder clashed like crazy when it came to roster construction and and drafting players. There was Desmond Bain who was there for the taking and the Jazz went with Yudoka Azabuke. Um, when you had just given Derek favors, the full mid-level exception, like what the fuck are you doing? You know? And like, so I think, you know, you've proven, yeah, that like Rudy struggles with the five out lineup, but he's so, so good in every other scenario. He murdered that Memphis Grizzlies. Like he made Jonas Valanciunas, who is a good player, not an all-star, but fringe, I would put him fringe all-star status, made him irrelevant in that series, you know, and has proven time and time again that he is super valuable. What you need are guys who can, who can counter that, that switching ball moving five out lineup where you can still have Rudy go bear in, but you can switch everything else on the perimeter and you're not getting beat and you're not getting Terrence man dropping 40 on you in a game six. So no, I, I still want Rudy go bear on the jazz. I want more versatility. Okay. And, wh- and what about you, Jay? Yeah, and, and to to Greg's point, uh, you can look at you know, like he said, what the management's doing now and bringing in, like you mentioned earlier, Rudy Gay, and then also uh, being a Warriors fan, bringing in Eric Pascal, who's you know yes. an emerging emerging versatile you know counter to that. He can play the small ball five. He can play four. Um, obviously, his his defense is something he's going to have to work on, and and. I think he's in the perfect place to develop that. I mean, they have a great system there defensively, you know, with Quinn Snyder, he gets his, all his guys to defend. Um, and, and he's going to be under the mentorship of Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gay and veterans uh, like Joe Ingles as well. So having that, you know, you know, that yin and yang is, is what's going to be important for them. And it's definitely not Rudy, uh, Rudy Gobert. Cause I mean, we can see he's one of the best defenders just in general in the league, but at the big, big man position, it's all about winning your mashup night to night. And he does that on a night to night basis 
with the best of them in the league. So it's not a Rudy Gobert problem, more of a roster makeup. Yeah. And, and to your point about Eric Pascal, um, first of all, I really like that signing and I think that he is a very intriguing prospect, <laughs> but I will be honest. I do not care if Eric Pascal plays a single minute for the Utah jazz. The fact that they brought him in and he is Donovan Mitchell's best friend from childhood. They played AAU ball together is all I need. Keep your superstar happy. And he yeah. gets to, he gets to pal around. He's also very good friends with Royce O'Neal and they all train together in the off season now as members of the Utah jazz. But even when Eric was with golden state, they would all go down to Miami and train together. So they're super close. So, I mean, little intangibles, like, like, chemistry and camaraderie goes such such a such a long way and i i think that eric pascal can contribute but even if he doesn't he's still my boy's best friend and that's ultimately all i care about i know that goes, that goes a long way i mean you guys both said it like um, when we're going back to the go it's not it's not a go issue is you know if i if i'm giving the keys to the jazz I'm not moving Gobert because, like you said, Johnny, you're not going to get the value that he brings is not what you're going to get back in return. I would just look how can I supplement him to have to fill in the gaps where he falls short, where he gets exposed. I mean, I say exposed, quote unquote. Yeah. Even him getting exposed is still a pretty good defender, right? So, so even as his shortcomings, I guess would be a better way to say it. I would try to just patch those holes yeah. with supplemental players, and that's pretty much it. Another thing, just reading the tea leaves and again, being semi team adjacent, one thing that has been floated is I know there were a lot of rumors during the trade deadline and during the draft that Joe Ingles was going to be moved. I would still keep my eye on that as an NBA fan. Um, but what we've seen over the last few years, Joe Ingles is a fabulous regular season player. Just had was was a hair shy of a 50, 40, 90 season this year, you know, and was in contention for six man of the year. He had a really bad playoffs and that makes back to back really bad playoffs. His his value has declined because of that. If he comes back and plays like he has in the in the past few regular seasons, that value is going to rise and I could see the jazz moving him. It would be devastating to jazz nation he is a beloved player if you want balding white guys come to utah <laughs> in chicago like, with caruso right <laughs> yeah i mean we've kind of we've kind of the corner corner of the market on like unathletic balding white guys <laughs> So he is very beloved. Um, I am a huge Joe Ingles fan. I, I love anybody who looks like a gym teacher who can cook you and then just talk shit for the entire game. Love the guy. Um, I do think he is a bit past his prime. I'm not going to put the wash label on him yet, but he is certainly not the same player he was a, a few years ago, but still could bring a lot of value. And if you're looking for that versatility in the jazz, you know, still look like they're one guy away would not surprise me to see him shipped at the trade deadline. I'm sure it would be great news for Paul George. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say, you know what? Like after what Paul George did in the playoffs against the jazz as a, as a member of the Clippers, I, I don't have anything else, man. Like when he got, when he got sunned by, by Ingles, when he was in Oklahoma city, I was I was relentless. You know, I had all the, I had all the photoshops. I had all the, you know, the daddy daycare memes, <laughs> That's but hilarious. I feel like those have been dead and buried. And yeah, he, he I really hate saying this, but I gained a lot of respect for Paul George in the playoffs, man. He made up for it for sure. I think he's kind of a wiener, but he, He's a baller, man. And what he did coming back from that leg injury is just Insane. its pretty unbelievable. It is crazy. So, Greg, we're just going to transition to a segment we call here Clutch Talk Timeout. So, mm -hmm. usually I'd ask who, who the number one option is, but, you know, you made it clear that it's Donovan Mitchell. And I think, you know, all, all three of us as well, you know, think it's Donovan Mitchell as the number one option. But to you, uh, do you think that Donovan Mitchell is a star or a superstar and why? I think right now Donovan Mitchell is a star with the poten potential to be a superstar. 
every single season we've seen Donovan Mitchell take a jump. Really? And a yeah. guy who can put up 35, five and five consistently in the playoffs. Guys, those are Jordan numbers. Yeah. That's yeah. superstar He's status. Yeah. And like what Donovan Mitchell did against the Clippers, granted, I know the Jazz lost in six games. That was not Donovan Mitchell's fault. Like, is really one of the more impressive things I've seen on a basketball court in a long time. And like, I, th- I have my qualms and sometimes I get after Donovan Mitchell when it comes to his defense because he has all the ability in the world to be like a Marcus Smart level defender. He's that quick. He's that strong. He's that fast. Uh, where I think uh, w- what hurts him, what hamstrings him is he has such an enormous load on the offensive end, he is the guy. the The guy who, if the Jazz don't have anything going, they throw the ball to Donovan Mitchell and say, "Make a play." There are very few players in the league who can do that and can actually deliver consistently. Um, but I think if if Donovan Mitchell is to ascend to superstardom, a I think he needs to be a bit more efficient. I think he needs to be a bit better playmaker. We saw shades of that this last season. Ultimately, what it what it boils down to is that I need Donovan to be a little, little bit more efficient, a little bit better of a playmaker, and a bit better of a defender. You know, I think he could he could really help when it comes to that versatility and that switching because of his strength and because of his athleticism. Um, I don't think he's far off, guys. Yeah. I think that Donovan Mitchell is very, very good and continues to get better. And he's still, he's still young. Like, I really don't think we have seen the best of Donovan Mitchell quite yet. And the thing that I love more than anything about Donovan is he's, he's a dog and Donovan wants to win. And he, he puts in the work. He's, he's in the film room all the time. He's in the weight room all the time. He's in the gym shooting all the time. He takes it super personal. Um, and that's exactly what you want out of your star. And um, if I, again, if I were a betting man, I would bet on Donovan Mitchell getting even better this next season uh, and uh, being, being right there. Yeah. I, I, and honestly, Greg, you know, when, when, when the question was asked, I really thought you were going to definitely say he's a superstar, man, because to, you know, to me, superstars are showing up when the biggest moments come, man. And, and, and that's exactly what he's done. Uh, but real, real quick, Greg, I, <clears throat> I have a couple of plays. I have a couple of players here and I just want you to tell me yes or no. Is Donovan Mitchell better than these people? Because I just hear all the time, like, is this player better? Is this player better? So just, just real quick, just I already off- know the guy you're going to talk about. <laughs> just off the top of your head, <laughs> just off the top of your head. Okay, I got a couple <laughs> players here. Okay, so Devin Booker. I can't say that with with the way Devin Booker played in the playoffs and the fact that he was the number one option on a finals team. Okay, I uh, think it's very close. Um, again, I am a I am a Devin Booker fan, which is uh, a bit of an anomaly as far as Jazz fans go. I always I always say that I am a fan of basketball much more than I am a fan of the Utah Jazz. Facts. Um, Me too. And I think that it's it's very very close. But if I was drafting, I'd probably go Devin Booker. Okay. What about Jamal Murray? Donovan Mitchell. Paul George. Paul George. Jalen right Brown. Now. Donovan Mitchell. Trey Young. Donovan Mitchell. Okay. Jason Ma- Tatum. Jason Tatum. I think Tatum's the best player of that draft. I, you know, and I, I think, think that Jason Tatum is an MVP caliber type of yeah. player. I do not think that Donovan Mitchell is quite there. Um, like, I think you can build around both players. I think it's easier to build around a Jason Tatum, especially because of his versatility on both ends of, of the both ends of the floor. Um, And like, he's both guys are the type of guys that you can throw the ball to and say, go get me a bucket, go win me a game. Jason Tatum is becoming the kind of guy you can throw the ball to and say, go get me 50. Yeah. On like any, on any given night, like he's, Mm -hmm. He's, like it, that. <laughs> he's kind of going into this season. I have some question marks about the, the Celtics this season. 
uh, I still think of everything clicks, he could be a dark horse MVP candidate. He's Man. that good. And he's another guy like Donovan Mitchell, who's but, taken a step every single season. Yeah. Um, no, he's, I, 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 think, I love Jason Tatum so much. Yeah. No, he's a great player. I think like, and you look at all the stars and superstars, I think he's, I think he's probably the number one guy in that star breaking into superstar class. I think. Like, yeah. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. I think he might already be there. He might already like, be there. That's the other and point. if and he, and if he's not like he's got one shoulder on leaning on the door yeah. into the room. He's like you Almost know he's like there. Jack Nicholson in The Shining right now, like <laughs> sticking his, sticking his <laughs> face right in the door. door. Yeah. Here, yeah, here's Jason. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. That's hilarious. Uh, so, all right. So, Greg, so, you know, as, as we start to uh, wrap it, wrap it up here, uh, two questions we love to ask here for uh -huh. these, uh, for, for these fan interviews is, you know, uh, Greg, barring injury, we, we can't uh, predict injury. We can't predict, especially a, a crazy season, like how we had last season, but just if, if you, if ever you have your whole healthy jazz team, how far do you guys make it in the playoffs and what, and what seating do you guys land in at the end of the year next year? I think the jazz are, no lower than the three seed they have if you look at the schedule it's incredibly front-ended and they're they're gonna make another run uh post all-star break they've got a cakewalk of a schedule um and i think i think the jazz are poised for a western conference finals run okay i it, like all things you know stars aligning somehow uh i don't know uh stocked in a malone croak of covid and we don't have their <laughs> legacy anymore That's i fucking hate both of them. <laughs> let me just go on this podcast and say that malone is a rapist and stockton is a crazy q anon freak and i hate them both um <laughs> but if, yeah if the stars align um i think the jazz could make a title run. Okay. I think, I think again, everything, all, all ducks have to be in a row. Stars have to be aligned. You know, it has to be a very special season. I look at this roster construction and, and what the jazz have done this season. And I have a hard time believing they're not a more talented team going into this season than they were last season. I don't think, uh, it can be stated enough how big of an upgrade Rudy Gay is over George Niang. And George Niang was a good player. And I think he's going to do very well in Philly. Uh, Philly is my second home. I, I love that place. I'm very excited for him to go there. Rudy, go, or, I mean, Rudy Gay is a better player. Just Right, absolutely. I don't think, yeah. you know, um, it breaks my heart to say this because he might be my favorite jazz player of all time, but Derek Favors is washed with a capital W. Definitely. Um, and as funny of a signing it is it as it is, and I am an agent of chaos, and I love nothing more than getting jokes off, bringing Hassan Whiteside in is, I think, could pay a ton of dividends, you know? Because I think he's... I, I think, I, I think I'm going out on a limb when I say that he's a better player at this point of his career than Derek Favors is. And he's going to be playing 10, 15 minutes a night against backup centers. Cool. And if it doesn't work, then you've got Yudoka Azabuke, who granted it was summer league, but looks like a boy against man or, or, or a man against boys. And I'm not all that worried about it. Um, and then you've got an, a, a team who's kind of flamed out in the playoffs twice now and has that sting. It kind of gives me watching what the Bucks did this year kind of gives me a little bit more hope as like a team that's gone through the trials and the tribulations. I think the the Jazz are right there. Um, so I think the absolute floor is another another second round flame out, which would suck. Um and I think the ceiling is a title run. Okay. Okay. So, Greg, let me ask you something real quick. I know we're running a little short yeah. on time, but I, All good. I, since you brought it up, I do, I do want to ask this. If it does become another second round flame out, what do you do? Do you keep trying the same formula? Do you try to oh, maybe no. make a drastic move? We'll I cross think that I, when we get to it. Yeah. Um, 
I think you would have to really look at the roster and yeah. and ask yourself some hard questions. Um, okay. I mean, that, that would mark what like five or six years. I wouldn't say shortcomings, but I think that they probably could have gotten further. Yeah, the la- yeah like absolutely. Last few times, so I don't want to say yeah. shortcomings. Like it's a no. Bad I think. I think, you know, blowing the three, one lead against the nuggets who I will say with the caveat that I think that the nuggets were the better team and they ended up proving that, uh, in the playoffs, but still again, get your three, one jokes off, man, because the jazz blew the three, one lead. Like that was a thing that happened. Um, and they flamed out, they flamed out against, against the Clippers, you know, right. and you can't really argue against that. If they do it again, then yeah, I think you really have to make some hard decisions. Like, you know, is Donovan Mitchell, that guy is Rudy Gobert, that guy. Um, and I think, you know, guys health has been in, in, question i'm i think i'm going on a bit of a tangent one one of the storylines that really intrigues me this year is quinn snyder played his end of bench guys fewer minutes than any coach in the nba last year okay and i think that was a huge reason why the jazz flamed out is because they were so exhausted by the end of the season guys like ingles and bogey and then conley got hurt but like they were super tired and you just can't do that in a condensed season. I'm very interested to see if Quinn gives his end of bench guys more minutes, you know, uh, on unsalvageable. We, we interviewed Jarrell Brantley, who I am a huge fan of and think that like he could be that like versatile wing defender, the jazz need. I mean, he's like, he's six, seven, he's two forty. He's a good shooter. Awesome defender. Um, so I'm I'm interested to see what the minutes look like. Do, do you know does Joe Ingles and Mike Conley and Bogey and these guys who are on the off, you know the wrong side of 30 do they sit on some back to backs? You know, right. are we resting guys? Or, you know, because again, like it doesn't mean a damn thing if you're the number one seed. I would much rather the Jazz go into the playoffs at full strength as the number three or number four yeah. seed, then hobble in as the number one seed. Yeah. I said that so many times throughout the season. I, for me, I'm a big Lakers fan. Yeah. The yeah. whole season. I was like, they're coming off a short season. Like, I don't care if they get in as the eighth seed, as long as they get in healthy. Yeah. They got into the seventh seed and not healthy. So it ended up working yeah, out. Yeah. And that, you I know, hundred percent we've seen, I, I think last season was, I mean, really put injuries front and center and just yeah. how um, how important health is and having your full roster, you know, and top to bottom, you know, I will say this. I think the Jazz one through seven are as good as any team in the NBA. Those those end of bench guys who the Jazz need to rely on more is a bit of a question mark. Right. And they're. You know, if, if you're a glass half full kind of guy, it's, oh, well, this is a great opportunity for some of these young guys to make the leap. You know, guys like Rudy Gobert and, and Royce O'Neal, they got their their start in the G League and Rudy Gobert now is likely going to be a Hall of Famer. So and I understand this is a hypothetical. This is an anecdotal situation, but um there's a real opportunity there and I'm very intrigued by that. And I think if they play the cards right and guys are healthy, the jazz really could make some noise again, like Donovan Mitchell and Mike Conley are healthy in that Clippers series. We're not having these conversations about the jazz fizzling out. Like they're in the Western conference finals. They might be in the finals, you know, and even if they go down against the Suns, like that's still a, a, a very positive, good season. So that to me is the the number one storyline going into next season for the Utah right. Jazz. Okay, okay, and 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 a last question that we we like to ask here is is Greg, you know, as a Jazz fan, if you could give us one word or one phrase to describe about how you felt about this past season that just ended, and then one word or one phrase to describe about how you feel about this upcoming 2021-2022 season. Um, my, my word for last season is it's a bit of a conjunction. It's God damn it. <laughs> okay. I like that. <laughs> um, th- this, uh, I have two words for this upcoming season and that is cautious optimism. 
Okay. Cautious optimism. Okay. We've, we, we are a hurt bunch. We have spent years as bridesmaids. And, you know, I will say, I've said this multiple times that I feel like I'm a pretty level headed adult at this point. Um, I gained a lot of my coping skills by being a Utah jazz fan. (laughs) I'm not usually the type of guy who gets very emotional when it comes to sports. I was 13 years old, 13, 14 years old when, when Jordan hit the shot. It's the one and only time I've ever cried uh, when it comes to a sporting event. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of hurt. So I'm, I, I have, I, I, I am excited about this season. I think the jazz got better and you, you bettered a number one seed um, but again, there's always that cautiousness of like, I don't want to get hurt again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like, I, so I like it. I like, God damn it. And cautious. <laughs> I like those words a lot, man. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so Greg, Greg here, you know, uh, what we like to do here on clutch talk at the end of the episodes, we like to do the quick, uh, uh, game cl- closing segment called guess the player. This is how guess the player works. I have three players here listed, uh, okay. both, uh, both you, Jay Hill and junior, you guys have two guesses. Uh, I I'm going to, I'm going to read off a bunch of accolades, things that this player, things that these players were known for the schools that they went to. And you guys each have two guesses, uh, to, to, to guess it. You got it. Oh man, you're putting me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's all right, let's do this. Let's do this. Jay, Jay Hill and Junior, they, they got you. They're gonna help you. All right, let's do this. So the first player, he played for three teams. He got drafted by the Utah Jazz. He was the first round ninth pick. He's a one-time all-star, a one-time gold medalist. He went to Butler for a college. Oh, it's Gordon Hayward. Yes, sir. Yes, Jeez. sir. There you go, Greg. There you it's go. It's a one-time all-star thing. I yeah. Mean, okay. he had more. All right. Let's he, do he would have had more had he not, you know, turned his Entire. ankle into ground chicken. <laughs> <laughs> for real. Opening night. I'll never forget that. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right. Let's do it. All right. Next player here. This guy, he played for six teams. He's a four-time gold medalist, a two-time athlete of the year, a one-time NCAA champion. Is this mellow? Yes, sir. Yes, Jeez. sir. Yeah. 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 You said you said he's well. He's like the only four-time Olympic or Olympic gold medalist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. He is. Olympic yeah. like Olympic mellow. Yeah, might be <laughs> like yeah, like top five favorite player of all time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I love. Yeah. Like, give me, give Olympic me Olympic Mello. Mello. Could you imagine Mello playing in FIBA? Could you imagine him? Like, bro oh. would be putting up Will Chamberlain numbers Dude, we saw on, on, on and off watch. the court. His game's built. <laughs> His game's built. <laughs> yeah, on man. Off the court. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So, so l- 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 let's get into this last player here. Last player. So this guy, he has his jersey retired by his college. He's still currently playing in the NBA. He's a six-time All-Star, a one-time NBA champion. Oh, that's just th- – oh, okay. So it's a different different guy than I had originally thought. Keep going. A one-time gold medalist. He's played for four teams. When people g- give an analogy on this player, they say he's a pit bull. Okay. Okay. He he is part of a, he was part of a championship team that Kawhi Leonard was on as well. Kyle Lowry. Lowry? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Jesus. There you go, man. Greg Hell was yeah. on fire for these, man. Just just going, man. But Greg got a lot of knowledge on the NBA, man. There you go, man. So th- th- this is a good point for us to go ahead and hear and start uh, wrapping it up here, man. Greg, we want to thank you very, very much for uh, blessing us with your time here. Uh, do you got any last words you, w- you want to say here before we uh, before we start signing off here, Greg? Uh, not not really. I mean, we've done all the plugs and everything. I just want to say thank you very much for having me on. This has been a wonderful conversation and I'm very excited for this upcoming season. Man, so 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 am I, man. Jenner, you got any last words for Greg I'm and all the jazz excited. fans? I'm excited. I'm excited. I think it's gonna be 
you know, I think it's going to be a really good season uh, for the Jazz to kind of, I think, make that make that step towards, you know, seeing a conference finals or, you know, an NBA finals, even, you know, if they, if they can get, I think, you know, I obviously I don't have them as one of my favorites and that's not a knock on the jazz, but I, I do think that they have the roster to, you know, if the cards kind of lay in the right places, I think they can execute them and take advantage of that. Jahu. Yeah, definitely. No, Greg, appreciate you coming on. First of all, great guest. And, and yeah, I think I'm excited for the jazz as well. I think personally, I think they will be a top three seed in the West as well. Uh, like Greg, and I think they ha- made some great additions this past off season, and I think they can can make some noise down the stretch in the, in, in the playoffs. So, we'll see. Yes, sir, man. So, as always, guys, uh, for you guys listening on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe, uh, and, and leave us leave us a ranking on Apple Podcasts, man. Leave us a comment, and make sure you guys go check out go, go check out Greg and the Unsavage Utah Jazz podcast, man. But if that's it. And we out of here, y'all. Clutch talk out.